This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Legs No discussion of the stranger magical items in Dungeons & Dragons, which is what we've been doing over these past few weeks in case you forgot. No discussion of strange magical items would be complete without mentioning the weirdest and out of placest of them all. The Apparatus of Qualish Part robot crab, part submarine, this strange part magical, part mechanical device has been around since the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons first edition Dungeon Master's Guide in 1979. And it has been updated for every edition of D&D since. And this thing is strange. Basically, the apparatus is a metal barrel big enough to accommodate a human being. Inside, one will find numerous levers. One seals the barrel and makes it watertight. One extends legs from the underside of the barrel. One extends gripping claws. One turns on the headlights, which look like eye stalks. And one makes it swim up and down. We're not making any of this up. This really is a magical item that exists in every edition of D&D. Clearly, such a fantastic device must have an amazing story. Given all of the literature and mythology and history that D&D has drawn on for inspiration, the device must lead somewhere interesting, right? Maybe it goes back to Hero, the first century Greek inventor who created the Eolopile, a primitive steam engine. Or perhaps it is one of Leonardo da Vinci's lesser known inventions, like the ornithopter or the ball bearing. Yes, he invented ball bearings. And from Leonardo da Vinci, we can discuss the Assassin's Creed series and the Knight Templar. After all, this podcast is basically just a really nerdy version of Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Did you know that term, Six Degrees of Separation, originated in a 1929 collection of short stories that dealt with themes of city planning and social connections which were in vogue in the 1920s? Oh yes, this is going to be a great episode. Let's get into it. What is the secret history of the apparatus of Qualish? And who was Qualish really? Sumerian god? Celtic hero? Greek explorer? Qualish was Tim Kask's first magic user, and he totally made up the apparatus for funsies. And we've talked about him before. Remember? First employee of TSR? Play tester of the original D&D with Gary Gygax? Yeah. He revealed in an internet forum that Qualish was his character, and he barely remembered the stupid robot crab thing, but that it was probably an inside joke about something. The folks at TSR were always naming stuff after themselves and adding stupid in-jokes. The Boulette got renamed to the Land Shark after a Saturday Night Live skit about the movie Jaws. Seriously. So that's it. Robot Crab Submarine was an in-joke no one remembers based on a character someone once played in Gygax's basement. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me. Uh, okay, wait, wait, stop the music. You can find more. We just thought of another weird magical item with legs and a control panel. Sort of. Let's talk about Baba Yaga's Dancing Hut. Baba Yaga's Dancing Hut has a long D&D pedigree. As long as the apparatus of Qualish, since it also appeared in the artifacts section of the original AD&D Dungeon Master's Guide. But unlike the apparatus, which merely gets updated to every edition of D&D, thrown into a magic item section and forgotten, the Dancing Hut has gotten a lot of attention over the years. The hut itself is, as the name implies, a hut. A smallish, thatched roof, circular, one-room home. Perfectly normal. From the outside. Well, almost. There are a pair of giant, stilt-like chicken legs that it roams around on. But aside from that, perfectly normal. Inside, the extra-dimensional hut is far bigger and contains a veritable palace of rooms and hallways and gardens and chambers. One might even call it a labyrinth. Or a dungeon. Ostensibly, it was created by the most powerful wizard ever, Baba Yaga. 
who disappeared for parts unknown. Her hut wanders the world imbued with magical intelligence and waiting to fall under the control of some lucky adventurer. And that is all the Dungeon Master's Guide had to say about it. But a few years later, in 1984, in Dragon Magazine issue number 83, an adventure module was published that was touted as a high-level challenge for expert players. The Dancing Hut. Basically, it is a walking dungeon. The players first hear about it because its inhabitant has been flying around the countryside in a cauldron, stealing and eating children or plundering magical items. The heroes enter the hut, confront the powerful witch Baba Yaga, defeat her, and claim the hut. The End the same basic adventure was rewritten years later as a roaming extra-dimensional dungeon in the 1995 AD&D 2nd edition module, The Dancing Hut of Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga herself appeared several times during D&D's history. In 1986, Roger Moore wrote a gamebook, basically a single-player choose-your-own-adventure style module, called The Nightmare Realm of Baba Yaga for D&D's Super Endless Quest Adventure series. Yes, that really was the original title. It sounds like what would happen if you translated the books into Japanese and then back into English, doesn't it? And Baba Yaga also had a cameo in the much maligned 1988 adventure collection Castle Greyhawk, a collection of adventures so whimsical and terrible that fans accused TSR of publishing them purposely to insult Gary Gygax's original Castle Greyhawk adventures. But, unlike the apparatus of Qualish, the idea of a crazy old super witch flying around the countryside in a cooking pot and kidnapping children to take back to her magical cottage that runs around the forest on chicken legs. That wasn't just a wacky in-joke by some random TSR employee trying to write a joke into the game no one would get. Baba Yaga is a mythological figure. And she isn't funny at all. She's terrifying. But she's also shrouded in mystery and confusion and her origins are as difficult to track down as the people who first told tales of Baba Yaga. When Rome ruled most of Europe, the Romans classified anyone who lived outside of Roman rule as barbarians. This included Germanic tribes like the Franks, the Goths, the Visigoths, and so on, who you might remember from our discussion about King Pippin the Short. But it included a lot of other tribes as well, and one such tribe was the Slavs. The problem was, the Romans didn't keep very good records about these cultures, and the cultures didn't keep good written records about themselves. So we don't know too much about the Slavs. Historians and archaeologists argue to this day about when the Slavs arose as a unique culture, whether they were settled or nomadic, what their culture was like, and who ruled them. It wasn't until the 6th century CE that anyone bothered writing anything down about the Slavs. Authors from the Byzantine Empire referred to them as the Sclavini, and during this time, they were at war with the Romans. What happened was this. Around 445 CE, a large nomadic tribe known as the Huns became unified under their new leader, Attila. He was known as Attila the Hun, because he was a Hun. During this time, the Roman Empire was struggling with internal corruption, unrest, disease, famine, and earthquakes. It was a tough time to be a Roman, and Attila knew an opportunity when he saw one. He went to war with Rome and conquered much of the eastern portion of the Roman Empire until the Romans paid him to stop conquering them. Attila's brutal campaigns left the lands devastated. Fortunately for everyone except the Huns, Attila married a woman from a Germanic tribe and then, during his honeymoon, died of internal bleeding. After the death of Attila, the Hunnic Empire didn't survive long, and by 550 CE there was a massive power vacuum in Eastern Europe and a lot of people who had been displaced by the Huns' conquests. The land was lawless and devastated and filled with desperate people, including the Slavs, who chipped away at Rome's crumbling borders. They kept the forces of Rome at a stalemate for many years and were able to expand and solidify their holdings, even penetrating as far as Constantinople in present-day Turkey. The Slavs were eventually driven back by the forces of Byzantium, but by that point, they had well-defended settlements in the Balkans and in Central and Eastern Europe. 
From that point on, their culture spread and diverged. It should be noted that most of the history of the Slavic people has been traced by the spread of their language. See, if you look at the various languages around the world, you'll discover that many languages have similarities to each other. For example, the Romance languages of Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Romanian, and Provençal all share a common root in the language of Rome, Latin. And that tells us something about how Roman culture spread and where it ended up. Even though the languages are different today, they have common ancestor languages. And by tracing the Slavic languages, Bulgarian, Czech, Croatian, Polish, Serbian, Slovak, and Russian, we know something about how far Slavic culture spread. And that brings us to Baba Yaga. How? Because the word Baba has a similarity with many words in many different Slavic languages that all roughly translate to old woman. Though interestingly, in some Slavic languages, the same root can refer to a spineless, cowardly, or weak-willed man. It is theorized that this is the equivalent of calling someone a sissy or a girly man. Yaga is a little stranger, and scholars theorize that it could be a reference to snakes, to wickedness, or to strange religious icons of local Slavic gods. And the ambiguity about Baba Yaga doesn't end at her name. See, on the surface, Baba Yaga seems to be a fairly typical boogeyman, or boogeywoman if you prefer, of the sort you expect in folk tales and fairy stories. She's a withered old crone or witch who lives in a forest hut that can walk around on stilt legs. The hut has a fence made of human bones, and its windows are eyes, and the door lock has teeth. She flies around in a pestle, and uses a mortar to stir her little flying cauldron. She kidnaps children and eats them. Fairly straightforward, right? Well, not really. Because if you really dig into the folklore, there's a lot more to her than meets the eye. In one tale, she's very clearly a villain of the standard forest witch type. After the death of his wife, a father marries a standard wicked stepmother. She, the stepmother, sends the kids away to Baba Yaga to be rid of them. There, they are imprisoned, and Baba Yaga fully intends to eat them. But the kids escape with the help of Baba Yaga's pet cat and her furniture by being nice. They feed the cat, which Baba Yaga never does, and oil the gate, which Baba Yaga also never does, and the cat and the gate help the kids escape. There's some other stuff running around her house too that helps the kids. Basically, it's a bit like the castle from Disney's Beauty and the Beast, but without the part where a vicious, spiteful monster locks up innocent children who the furniture then helped... Oh, wait. In that story, Baba Yaga is clearly an obstacle. But in many other stories, Baba Yaga turns out to be something of a benefactor, even a helper. The most famous of these is Vasilisa the Beautiful. Vasilisa is a beautiful young lady whose father marries a standard wicked stepmother. When the father goes away on a trip, the stepmother sells the family home and moves the girl to a hut in the woods where she is given impossible tasks to complete and threatened with punishment by her stepmother and stepsisters. Basically, she's worked to the bone. It's a bit like Cinderella. Vasilisa wanders out of the house one night to find more light for her sisters, and she encounters Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga challenges the girl with difficult tasks and rewards her efforts with a magical doll and a lantern. These rewards help Vasilisa escape the house, displace the stepmother, and marry the Tsar of Russia. While Baba Yaga definitely helps Vasilisa, it's interesting to note that she's pretty amoral about it. By the time Vasilisa escapes with the lantern and the doll, Baba Yaga has tormented the girl pretty fiercely and has committed a few pretty grisly murders to help drive the stepmother and stepsisters away. And this story also reveals that Baba Yaga is far, far more powerful than a mere witch. At one point, three servants arrive at the hut and Vasilisa asks who they are. Baba Yaga explains they are the sun, the day, and the night all of whom she controls. Scholars have long discussed and debated the nature of Baba Yaga and her origins. While she is almost universally amoral, she does not seem to go out of her way to cause strife. Instead, she only torments those who find her or her hut, and often she is sought because she is considered to be extremely wise and powerful. She might be a dangerous enemy, or she might render aid, depending on the story. But her help is always dangerous and impersonal 
and often immoral. Combined with some apparently vast powers of nature, it has been theorized that she's a conflation of numerous different mythical figures and archetypes. Part Mother Nature, part Wise Woman, part Fairy Godmother, part Cruel Forest Witch. And it has even been suggested by some that the change in her nature has reflected a change in the views of wisdom and magic over the long years. Once upon a time, the Slavic people viewed age and wisdom as positive things, and older women were respected for their intuition, advice, and knowledge. But during the Middle Ages, superstitions and a fear of magic began to emerge, and the archetype of the wise woman was replaced by the archetype of the witch, using her age and wisdom to evil ends. There are so many different stories and accounts, though, that it's hard for anyone to say definitively. So how can you use all of this in your game? Well, the HUD is a neat magical item, and you can always do one of those roaming dungeon on stilts with a powerful witch in the driver's seat adventures if you're boring. Or you can take a page from the Baba Yaga stories themselves. Baba Yaga is extremely wise and powerful and fickle, and she has some sense of justice and fairness, but she is cold and cruel and impersonal in doling it out. Those who seek her aid suffer for it, and sometimes they fail. In that sense, she is like a force of nature. She cares nothing for human feelings and desires, and she is a source of both boon and bane. She could probably destroy the world, but she doesn't care to. She is a perfect mythical figure for a D&D world. No one knows anything about her. There's a thousand stories, all conflicting. In D&D, the great NPCs and gods and heroes and villains are all pretty straightforward, and the players and their characters know what they are dealing with. Or they can figure it out. But Baba Yaga? She's like the Tom Bombadil or Bjorn of Middle Earth. She's like the Q from Star Trek. She's a part of the universe and she has great power, but she's inscrutable and mysterious and amoral. And she's got a wicked streak a mile wide. So what happens when the party needs her help? And if that doesn't float your boat, you could just throw in a robot crab submarine. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com.